Nice weekend. Oh, and it's 3.01. So um, we do will have a recording available for those who, who might join in late. Um, but thank you for joining us. Um, and Linda, I'm going to turn it over to you. Thank you. Okay, thank you. So do you see my screen right now? Basically, I'm just showing the agenda for today. Yes, yes, we do. Great. Okay. So thanks, uh, Nathan, and also uh, Corey for inviting me to present or facilitate or bring together this um, discussion today. It's really important to me and to everybody else who's presenting um, on today's panel. Uh, so we have three topics, and the second one has two speakers. So I'm going to just rush through uh, the intro so we have time for all of this content and Q&A at the end. So at the very beginning, I'll be discussing about data storage materiality, and especially in the context of audiovisual content, because then you have two problems when you're trying to preserve audiovisual content, which um, I'll describe it quickly. The second presentation is toward environmentally sustainable digital preservation. We'll have Keith Pendergrass and also Laura Alagna discussing on this. And it's basically, it's kind of a, um, they're going to be drawing upon an article that's going to be published in the SAA Journal of the American Archivist this summer. So in a way, this is a preview of, of that article. One of their co-authors, Walker Sampson, I think is supposed to be listening in on the call, so he'll be available also for the Q&A at the end. Actually, in a way, the first two presentations here are going to be also, it's a preview Review of a presentation. We're on a panel at the RBMS conference in June in Baltimore. So it's really exciting to have this quick um, run through before we present next month. And then the last uh, topic is going to be a presentation from Danielle Kale, who's an MA student in NYU's MIA program. And she had conducted a survey of various institutions on their environmental practices in the context of digital stewardship. So this is what we're going to do, and I'm going to be a strict timekeeper to make sure that there's time to run through everything and give and allow for time for a good conversation at the end. So let me just go ahead and jump right into my part here. So again, and actually the presentation that I'm giving is a subset. It's a very much um, revised, shortened version of a longer presentation that I give. And if you want to see the full slides, there's a link here. And all of the presentations that you're seeing today, they will be available as PDFs on the NDSA site after the call. Um, just let you know. But you can also, for the full presentation of what I'm talking about, there it is on the Digital Bedrock website. So let's just jump in. And so why am I first starting with audiovisual preservation? Well, there are two parts to that. For any of you who have in your archives, you have analog media, which can be um, audio or video on tape. You have to digitize it. It's actually imperative because that media is dying. And in the next few decades, you have no choice, but you have to. If you want to preserve the content, you must digitize it for preservation and for access in the future. So you have to preserve those files on data storage devices. Again, my presentation is more on the actual materiality of the data storage. And then you also then have to deal with getting rid of, discarding somehow all of that analog media that you just digitized that's sitting on your shelf. And then archives also have the audiovisual content that they're receiving as boring digital files. So that's a two-pronged approach. You're preserving both the files that were then transferred to from analog originals to digital as well as receiving boring digital. So when you're talking about analog to digital transfers, you know, we're all trying to think about what is our impact on the world, you know, when we're with both the physical original analog media plus the digital files that we're then preserving. Because eventually you're going to have what I call media carcasses. There's going to be no content on those video or audio tapes that are sitting in your vault. So what do you do with the responsibly discarding of those? And so thinking about the estimate of the total number of hours, again, around the world, and most of the studies have been focused on libraries, archives, and museums, or cultural heritage organizations, but there is just so much more than that, meaning entertainment, corporate, consumer, think about all of the home videos that are out there. So there have been some estimates at, you know, trying to figure out how much, you know, magnetic media might be out in the world, but the estimates that have been performed so far are only for cultural heritage organizations, and they run anywhere from 46 million hours to 570 million hours, and then at the bottom, there's a, at what the Library of Congress in their uh, National Audiovisual uh, Conservation Center, what they've been digitizing and preserving, so that increases every year. So I just am going to estimate, all right, let's say 400 million hours total from all sectors around the world. And so if you digitize that audio and the video at the recommended high resolution formats, then I'm estimating that could be 14,600 petabytes. That's 14.6 exabytes of data. 
that's only one set of files. Now, ideally, of course, in preservation, you want to have three sets, but let's just say two sets. For redundancy, that's over 29 exabytes of data that somehow has to get stored if we want to have preservation to be able to access these files in the future. Now, those are just estimates that I'm just throwing out there, but let's look at the hard numbers of the actual storage media, the devices that have been sold. So in, 20, in only the second quarter of 2018, Seagate, which is a hard drive manufacturer, they shipped out 92 exabytes worth of storage. In 2017, all of the LTO media that was sold was over 108 petabytes of data. And then you can see these other numbers down the line. So that is still, it's a lot of data that's being stored just by the nature of the physical media that's been sold. So preserving all of that content and making it accessible, it's going to impact the environment because you have that legacy media destruction, all those media carcasses. You have the electricity use to being able to preserve the 29 exabytes of data. And it's going to be using energy resources that can be dirty or clean. And then you have to destroy some of the hardware and media because as you all know, you're going to be recycling and refreshing and migrating data from one old storage device to a new one over time. What do you do with all of that old media and hardware? Can you recycle it? Is it just incinerated? Is it just dumped into a landfill? So earlier this month, just a couple weeks ago, I received this email from somebody who said that one of their companies needs to dispose of essentially 255 tons of videotapes. And they were aware that this could be an environmental hazard because the videotapes had chromium in it. So they're concerned about that contamination of the soil. They're assuming it's just going to go into a landfill and it's going to go into the water, the groundwater. And so we had a discussion about what they can do with this, but that made me pause when I read this email. I thought, hmm, I'm assuming these are like VHS tapes that are just in a warehouse that have not been written to, but it is still a matter of disposing of media. This is a huge problem. All right, so I'm going to jump now. That's just like presenting about how much analog, you know, video and audio material, which we might be stewards for in the future. Now let's talk about the materiality of the formats, the data storage and the magnetic media. So. What those will contribute to, and I'm not going to be talking about the environment and in the air because I think that Keith and Laura might be talking about that. I'm talking about the toxic endangerment. What happens when all of this media goes into the ground? 200 million people are at risk to toxic, toxic exposure. Um, now, we all know about the usual suspects for toxin producing entities, refineries, chemical manufacturing, et cetera, but now we have e-waste incineration. Electronic products have lifespans usually for the initial owner of two to eight years. We're talking here about your servers, your hard drives, your data tape, your computers, your phone. But then they have second service life. If they're recycled, they can be wiped, they can then be sold or provided to other owners. So that could go maybe five to 20 years, but then they're eventually going to totally die. And so then what happens? Landfill, incineration, recycling, or exportation. What that means for exportation is where mainly Western companies send all of their e-waste as, as their other trash to other countries. They export them to Asian underdeveloped countries. They're supposed to be for reuse or recycling, except for, and so there was a ban on this um, according to the, the Basel Convention. However, oftentimes they still put it under um, the bill of lading just as a secondhand goods, and it still gets shipped anywhere. And the hardware isn't really reused, it's just stripped for copper and other metals. So the metals that go into the devices, the data storage devices that we use, they're heavy and they're rare. Rare earth metals means they are rare because they're from the earth and you can't reproduce them. The heavy metals are just toxic by their nature. So less than 1% of the rare earth metals are actually recycled just because they're built into these devices in a way that's very hard to extract them. Same with the heavy metals. What's happening in some uh, areas is where these the e-waste ship to these other countries, and they're just burned, they're just incinerated in the open air, just in order to extract out the copper and the other metals. It goes into the air, goes into the soil, it goes into their food, it goes into the water. So splitting out all of these different things, I was just talking about rare and heavy earth metals. Now let's talk about the plastic, because of course plastic is with all of these devices. We all know about recycling our plastic. However, the plastic that are in computers and all these devices, they're a different formulation. So they have to be totally stripped out. If you have videotape as e-waste, so these are some of the things that could be potentially, um, or the parts of it that could be potentially recycled, you have the plastic shell, but again, it's a different formulation than our regular plastic that we just go out and recycle in our recycling bins. It has metal screws and parts and it has to tape itself. 
So the base is mylar, the binder, it has binder in it. Then there's the magnetic particles and it was that chromium oxide, which that email that I referred to before, that's what they're concerned about going into the landfill. I'm rushing through this quickly because I um, really want to cut to the chase and get to the end <laughs> for conversation. And you can read the slides later. So um, the videotape is EWIS. You have two options there other than like just dumping it in the landfill. You can shred the full item, you can incinerate it. But of course, you should be in a controlled incinerator environment and that varies from state to state, assuming you're all calling in in, in US countries. You can disassemble the tape, which is very labor intensive. You can then melt the plastic cassette and the screws and shred the videotape, but then you still have to deal with, with disposing of that videotape that you've shredded. So two vendor options, uh, like Sims Recycling Solutions, which is a global firm. Um, I contacted the California facility here. They'll separate out all those parts, but it's hot, very expensive because it's labor intensive. And then California has very strict incinerator regulations, so this is capped. Other states are maybe not so strong in their regulations. There is a company, Green Disc, in Washington State that will actually separate out the parts, and they're shredding the videotape, and they're just hanging on to it. So they have a warehouse that is filled with shredded video. Tape. Now let's go into the data storage. So because once you have that audio and the videotape is digitized, you still then have to store those digital files on something. So the, your options for storing it, physical car carriers are spinning disk, which can be placed on servers or in hard drives in an enclosure like a desktop hard drive. You can have digital tape like LTO. You can have NAND, which is solid state or flash. So oftentimes, and ideally, the best thing to do is you have a mix of the storage depending on the content or the file types. So it's hierarchical storage management or HSM. So you might have, if you need it immediately, you have it on online. If it's near line, we don't need it immediately. It could be taped in a robotic system, or if you just want to preserve it ongoing, you keep it offline. It doesn't need to be using all of that electricity. So the first thing I want to talk about is spinning disk. So this is an example of where it can be in a server. So you have a box, and then you have the drives that are in it. So they use a lot of electricity. Um, commonly now, what you'll want to use are helium filled drives that I have there in bold because that reduces the energy used by 23% because helium is lighter than air. So it spins cooler because and, and without less friction because it's lighter than air or with less friction. It has a life expectancy though you want to replace these every three to five years. That's the initial service life. And there are recyclable parts, but it is difficult to get the, um, those metals out of the media. Then we have external hard drives. Again, they're drives, but they're more in enclosures on your desktop. The electricity use could be low to medium um, because you could just turn it off when you're not using it. Same life expectancy, same potential recyclable parts, because so they're basically well, the same drives. Well, actually, I won't go into that, not quite, but almost. <laughs> the same manufacturing uh, principles. So for recycling the spinning disk, if you wanted to do that, there are three hard drive manufacturers. There's Western Digital, which owns uh, HDSC and Hitachi. We have Seagate, we have Toshiba. What I have up there are the, um, the their market share for uh, commonly right now. They do, they're very concerned about, you know, they know that they're using rare and heavy earth metals, and those rare earth metals cannot be reproduced. So they're actually studying to try to figure out how can we recycle those. So, um, but they say that it's basically death by screws because it's just they have to, it's too expensive for them to figure out the cost to disassemble and recycle all of those raw materials and it's cheaper just to do the simple shredding of it. They do recommend recycling through reuse but only for lower capacity hard drives, not for the large ones. However, just in the last like, week, I learned about these recent efforts. So Dell Seagate, which is one of the hard drive manufacturers in Teleplan, which is like a recycler, um, they've developed a method to scrape the rare earth metals and magnets from the hard drives to recycle them in new devices. So Dell Latitude 5000 notebook series are going to be using these recycled magnetic drives, which is really exciting. Um, they're also recycling gold from smartphones that will go into the notebook tablet hybrid. So this is really great. Um, there's also, I just read this news uh, like yesterday, um, and there are links here about there are two projects going on about how to recover the precious metals and plastic from end of life electronics. So there is a lot of work in the industry. And so we just need to keep pushing as a community to really keep pushing for this. Now data storage tape. Okay, we have LTO, low medium use because if it's offline, it's just stored offline. You know, it's not taking up electricity. Uh, life expectancy though, you want to replace it every two to three generations. And it does have potential recyclable parts, which are the metals, the plastic, except for you need to be able to get that magnetic material off of the mylar ribbon. So that is where uh, there's been some R&D efforts uh, going on. 
Now, the spinning disc and tape, so now we're talking about electricity use, the total cost of ownership. Putting things on tape is 26 times less expensive. Uh, I'm sorry, putting it on spinning disc is 26 times more expensive than tape based. That's because of electricity use, which is why folks are encouraged to split up how you're storing your, your data. You need to have something readily accessible, put it online. On, spinning this. If you don't need access to those really large files, put it on tape. You, know, you can mix it up. You don't have to do all of one or the other. Then we have SSDs, solid state drives, which have no moving parts. They run cooler. They um, don't, do not use rare earth metals, but they do have silicon and copper in them. If you're using the cloud, there's been a lot of discussions on the NTSA communities on using cloud storage, but that's just putting on somebody else's servers. So if you're going to do that, it's not just out of sight, out of mind. If you want to be really thoughtful about your environmental impact, then figure out what your cloud vendor's power source is. Is it dirty or is it clean? And I recommend that you go and you look at this Greenpeace report, Clicking Clean, which has scorecards and describes um, various cloud providers and how they're trying to use renewable energy. All right, I have two minutes left. I'm timing myself as well. So now let's get to the nitty gritty. What can you do to try to do this? And I'm not going to go into areas, I hope, that Keith and Laura will talk about. I'm really talking about physical stuff. So, but using less electricity, which means you're thinking about how you're storing the files and what media, it really helps the environment plus it saves you money. So as I was just saying, store your really large and frequently active files on data tape, keep it offline. If you're using LTO, don't migrate it every time a new generation comes out. You know, you can wait two or even three generations. We don't have time to go into that, but um, if there's interest later on, I can explain what I mean by that. If you have a server room on site, then everybody thinks server rooms have to be really, really cold. They don't need to be anymore because of the technology. The servers run cooler. They, um, I mean, like the data center where we're located, the data center, the floor is like 72 degrees, um, which, is, which is pretty good. Um, turn off any unused servers, set the servers to go into inactive mode if you're not using them. If you are buying a server and if you are, have several applications, if you can, virtualize them. So you have virtual servers, you know, virtual applications on one server. Uh, use the cloud for some, but you want to verify the provider's green record. And if you're using, I have data co-location center, but basically same thing. If you're on a university campus, go and talk to your IT folks if you're storing your data with them. Ask, go and give a tour. You know, have them show you what their power source is, how cold is it, or how warm is it. You know, what is their green record? Try to, if you can, if you have that kind of control, purchase clean energy where it's possible, not coal generated. Purchase hardware that is energy efficient. And purchase recycled devices, uh, which means, like, for example, what we do is we'll get a server box. And in fact, it's funny, it still has the Facebook barcode on it. But what we do is we bought the box used, recycled, and then we put in new drives into it. And so you don't need to upgrade servers by upgrading by buying a whole new drive, a server. Just upgrade the drives inside it. If you recycle by reuse, use vendors who don't ship overseas. And then also, if you're going to be recycling, go and talk to whoever's doing that for you and find out what do they mean by recycling. You know, are they shipping overseas? Are they incinerating? You know, be thoughtful. Be um, be aware of how your actions are then impacting the people you're working with. What are they doing? How is that impacting the environment? All right, so that's the end of my talk. And again, the slides will be up online. So I'm going to stop my presentation. Let me see here, stop share. And I'm going to pass it over to Keith and to Laura. Great, thank you, Linda. Um, everybody can see key slides, right? Yep. Good. Okay. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, today, Keith and I are going to talk about research that we've done with uh, Walker Sampson and Tim Walsh on environmental sustainability of digital preservation. Um, our complete work is going to be published in the forthcoming issue of American Archivist, which I believe should drop um, pretty soon now because it's the spring summer one. Uh, I'm going to summarize the reasons for our work, that is, why we need to critically examine our digital preservation practices, and Keith will describe the paradigm shift that we propose to create environmentally sustainable digital preservation. Uh, currently, there's no conclusive quantitative research on the complete impact of digital preservation practices, 
Um, though, like Linda said, we can get some estimates based on uh, projecting you know, what we know already in terms of how much storage people have. Um, but to get around this and get a more general idea of how digital preservation impacts the environment, we research the environmental impacts of the technologies and infrastructure upon which digital preservation relies. Uh, information and communication technology, abbreviated as, as ICT, is the interconnected infrastructure that makes digital preservation possible. It includes devices ranging from desktop computers, to cell phones, other items with microprocessors, or network connectivity, data centers, et cetera, et cetera. Um, as well as all of the networking infrastructure required to connect all of these components. Digital preservation obviously relies really heavily on ICT in almost every respect, so its environmental impacts are directly related to those of ICT. In our research, we used a life cycle approach to examine the full environmental impact of ICT, meaning that we looked at the environmental impacts throughout a product's life cycle rather than just calculating something like recurring energy costs in order to get a more complete picture of its impacts. Given the pervasiveness of ICT components and their complex life cycles, which I'll talk about more in a second, the scope of ICT's environmental impact is staggering. Um, Linda sort of went over this a little bit in her presentation, but um, I'll kind of walk us through the life cycle idea that we've looked at. Um, so in our American Archivist paper, we go through a lot of statistics on the various ways in which ICT negatively impacts the environment. But um, today I thought it'd be easier just to talk through one specific example. Um, so looking at an ICT component that makes up a tiny part of overall digital preservation practice but still has an impact, which is considering a single drive in a cloud data center. Um, the image on the slide shows a bauxite mine. Uh, bauxite is the world's main source of aluminum, which is one of the primary materials in many ICT components. Bauxite is generally strip mined, which is what this picture is showing, and requires an extremely energy intensive process to be refined into aluminum. So even at the very beginning of its life, it's already caused decreases in biodiversity through habitat loss um, and has used up water and required the burning of fossil fuels all at the very beginning of the process. Next, the raw aluminum is shipped and used in manufacturing the hard drive, all of which again requires more water and more fossil fuels. Then it's shipped again to the data center and during its life requires electricity and cooling, which is both water and energy intensive. Uh, eventually, at some point, it becomes obsolete and must be disposed of. Uh, Linda already touched on this a bit, but um, obviously major data centers are going to probably responsibly dispose of their equipment, but uh, globally, only 20% of e-waste is documented as collected and properly recycled, and the 80% remaining ends up in landfills or in toxic salvage yards in lower income countries. Um, despite how awful this all sounds, and I know at this point everybody's like, ooh, this is kind of a downer, um, we've thought about a lot of ways um, to reduce the impact of digital preservation. Um, so I'll go over briefly some ways to use current technologies to reduce its impact, um, a little bit of which Linda talked about today, but we've got a few more in here. To start with, you can implement practices that increase energy efficiency, such as prioritizing efficiency over performance in selecting new devices or systems, or following standard energy efficiency practices, such as powering off devices when they're not in use. Um, there's also some technologies such as uh, self-checksumming or self-healing file system ZFS, or error correcting memory that can lead to greater efficiencies. Another way to reduce digital preservation's impact through technology is to schedule high energy and high bandwidth tasks for off-peak times. Both the electricity grid and the telecommunications infrastructure are built to support peak load, which means that they can accommodate the highest load forecast for the year, even if most of the time a percentage of both are always idle. Not contributing to peak load helps to mitigate the need for new infrastructure and off-peak times may have a higher percentage of emission-free energy sources in use. Many of digital preservation's most taxing activities, such as transferring large amounts of data over networks or running fixity checks, can be scheduled for off-peak times, such as overnight or in an off-peak season. 
Um, we provide more details in our paper about this, so you can find out more about scheduling tasks there. Finally, uh, you can use clean energy sources where possible. This can range from advocating for the installation of clean energy devices at your organization to purchasing electricity or renewable energy certificates from clean energy generation sources or selecting vendor provided facilities and services powered by clean electricity. Um, all of these strategies that I've talked about can be implemented by anyone. Uh, very little advanced technical expertise would be required and can be done immediately, meaning you don't need to wait for some future miracle sustainable technology to increase your energy efficiency now. Um, but this isn't all you can do. Keith is going to talk more about the ways in which we can all work towards sustainable digital preservation in a more substantial and meaningful way. So I'll turn it over to Keith now. Hey, good afternoon, everybody. Um, so Linda and Laura exposed the environmental consequences of our digital preservation actions um, and provided some stopgap solutions that you can implement right now to reduce your impact. But the problem is larger than this. Cultural heritage organizations, or CHOs, globally preserve a significant amount of digital content, and this amount is growing rapidly. To address this scale and growth, as well as the negative impacts across the ITC component lifecycle, we need to move beyond reactive solutions to more deeply evaluate core digital preservation practices. We took a systems approach to this problem. Instead of viewing digital preservation as a set of discrete actions that take place in preservation repositories, we view it as an interconnected system of people and infrastructure that starts at acquisition and continues through to access. Donella Meadows tells us that when working within a system, the most impactful leverage point for creating positive environmental outcomes is a paradigm shift. Taking this to digital preservation, we need a paradigm shift in our core practice to responsibly reduce the amount of content we preserve while also reducing the energy and material intensity of our practices. But how do we create that paradigm shift for sustainability while still meeting user needs and fulfilling our organizational missions? John Ehrenfeld provides us with a framework for thinking about sustainability-focused paradigm shifts. Instead of just reducing the negative impacts of certain actions that result from the system, which he calls reducing unsustainability, you look at how you can change the system to meet needs in different ways. He calls this process creating sustainability. For the most part, our current digital preservation paradigm is management-centric and focused on achieving optimal results. We often focus on how much we preserve, how well we do so, and how much the content is used. We think of success as improving these stats, more content, better management, more use. And our frameworks and standards reflect this. They push us to optimal management whenever possible. This mindset is rarely challenged, and when it is, it is mainly from the viewpoint of funding and staffing constraints, such as the Digital Power Projects report on good enough digital preservation. To explore how to transition to sustainable digital preservation while still meeting user needs, we build on Ehrenfeld's sustainability framework. We incorporate Stephen Abrams' call at IPRES 2018 to reevaluate digital preservation success criteria, in which he argues that we should move from criteria that focus only or primarily on the management of digital content to include those that measure how we facilitate successful mediated communication between content creators and users over time, and we expand on Benjamin Goldman's challenge to current practice around digital authenticity in his contribution to the forthcoming essays in honor of Mark Green. Pulling these three works together leads us to reevaluate what is required for successful, sustainable digital preservation and to move away from our current management centric model to one that explicitly integrates and balances management, successful use, and environmental sustainability. We propose a three-part paradigm shift in which we recommit to conducting critical appraisal, which allows us to focus our resources on high-value materials, rethink our goals around digital permanence to reduce the resource intensity of digital preservation actions, and challenge our assumptions about the availability of digital content to meet user needs in different ways. For each area, we provide strategies for change that we intend as a framework for practitioners to think through a sustainability-focused paradigm shift. Also, we acknowledge that these strategies will not be a paradigm shift for all. Rather, for some, they may validate that decisions made out of financial or staffing necessity are the environmentally responsible choices. So let's start with the current state of appraisal. While in some ways the automation that is possible with digital content can make appraisal easier than with analog, in many ways it is more difficult. 
The ease of saving digital content often means that more is offered to CHOs. The ease of editing and copying means that duplication is common and can make it difficult to identify the record copy. And the appraisal of digital content requires additional expertise to master the tools and systems needed to interact with and understand the content. Coinciding with these challenges, storage costs have been steadily decreasing. And this leads us to a predictable outcome. With scarce staff time and cheap storage, we can end up with appraisal that is cursory at best. So we recommend several strategies for changing how we think about appraisal. And these decisions may be the most consequential of the three areas because they determine how much content continues through to our preservation systems and how much ICT infrastructure and energy is needed to support these systems. First, we should use appraisal as an opportunity for assigning levels of preservation commitment in a tiered approach so that only high value content receives the highest level of preservation care, while low value or surrogate content receives a lower level. When faced with duplication, we can remove unnecessary copies from within and across collections using metadata pointers to preserve context. Additionally, we can take the model of collective collecting from areas such as web archives and software preservation and apply it more broadly to prevent duplication across organizations. Our appraisal decisions do not always stand the test of time, but reappraisal has its own environmental impact as we access the digital content. However, we can take advantage of actions at other points in the object's life cycle to reappraise content with minimal impact. Finally, we should take environmental costs into account when making an initial appraisal decision, adding this to our analysis of value and costs when conducting an archival or technical appraisal. Once we determine that digital content has persistent value, we work to ensure the content's permanence. Current preservation models recommend technical and organizational infrastructure that focuses on active maintenance of digital files intended to preserve their integrity and authenticity. These activities that are resource intensive. Calculating checksums is computationally intensive and can result in large network loads. The environmental impact of the energy and hardware needed for frequent fixity checking is multiplied when we implement geographic redundancy. So how do we think differently about digital permanence? We should reevaluate our underlying assumption that the goal of digital preservation is zero loss or, ch or zero change or loss to content over time. For analog materials, we accept loss over time, from physical degradation to disaster to accidental damage. We do our best to prevent it, but know that a certain amount of loss is inevitable. We can responsibly alter our goals for digital preservation to align more with common practice for analog content by determining acceptable levels of loss for our digital content that would still meet user needs. We should balance criteria such as uniqueness, value, file format risks, and stakeholder needs to develop levels of acceptable loss for different types of content. And once we determine what our acceptable levels of loss are, we can implement tiered preservation solutions where each tier meets the need of a certain level of loss. To create these tiers, we can evaluate storage systems to reduce the environmental impact compared to traditional no-loss single-tier preservation solutions. We can alter our methods and frequency of fixity checks to take advantage of solutions that natively incorporate data integrity checks while responsibly reducing the frequency of these checks by correlating frequency with our threat assessments. We can add to our decision-making criteria when choosing storage technologies or service providers, critically evaluating characteristics such as efficiency, networking requirements, electricity sources, and hardware utilization percentages. We can create file format migration policies that are not overzealous in prescribing migration for low-risk formats. And we can implement appropriate levels of redundancy based on the value of the content, preferring nearline or offline storage systems for as many copies as is practical. Implementing these strategies allows us to reduce the resource and material intensity of our practices. And our appraisal and preservation efforts typically culminate in access to digital content. However, our profession spends much effort and resources on activities that do not necessarily meet the goal of successful use while having an adverse environmental impact. There's a continued focus on digitizing analog materials because of a general perception of value or interest or simply because they are analog. This can contribute a substantial percentage to the overall storage footprint of a digital preservation repository, especially when we digitize audiovisual materials. And when we talk about the success of these projects, it's often in terms of how much content is now available digitally and not about whether our digitization efforts have facilitated successful use. Using systems that meet the expectation of instant delivery of digital content increases the negative impact of these actions by requiring always on infrastructure. 
To have successful use with lower environmental impact, we ought to abandon the notion of mass digitization of, or digitization based on undocumented value. Instead, we should aim to digitize specific items when requested by users or those that are at risk from a preservation perspective. We should also move away from the default of instant delivery. By building in some delay, we can design our delivery infrastructure using nearline instead of online storage. And by building in slightly more delay, we can move to a model where we create access copies on demand instead of creating them on ingest. This avoids the need to store and checksum them while awaiting a potential future access request. These strategies, though, all hinge on good discoverability of our content and documentation of our processes. We must ensure that our content is easy to find and request and that the processes for on-demand digitization and delivery are clearly articulated. Otherwise, we risk unnecessary researcher trips to the reading room to view content that could have been digitized, as well as potential dissatisfaction with delayed delivery simply through a lack of understanding of the process. Changing our availability paradigm allows us to reduce the impact of our preservation and delivery infrastructures while likely increasing successful use through improved discoverability. As with appraisal and permanence, when we integrate environmental sustainability into existing decision-making criteria, we often maintain or improve our users' experiences while reducing financial, staffing, and environmental costs. He's five-minute so, warning. Oh, look at I, this. Thanks on this. Uh, so we hope that you will engage further with our ideas by reading our upcoming article in the American Archivist that goes into more detail than we have today on our paradigm shift framework and the supporting literature. The scientifically robust causal links between ICT infrastructure on which digital preservation relies and climate change and biodiversity loss give us an obligation to critically evaluate our practices. We look forward to starting this discussion and getting to work on creating environmentally sustainable digital preservation. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Keith. Thank you, Laura. That was great. Okay, so now we're going to turn over to Danielle, the last presenter, who will present uh, the results of a survey that she conducted. Danielle. Can everyone hear me okay? Yeah, there yep. you are. Okay, great. Um, so good afternoon to everyone, and thank you so much for having me on the call. My name is Daniela Calle, and I'm, in, I'm a student in the NIA program at NYU. Um, today I'm going to go briefly over the results of a survey I conducted in February titled Exploring the Environmental Impact of Digital Archives. And digital archives here are meant to be a catch-all term for those institutions who are in the business of collecting digitally. Um, the survey was disseminated to the listservs of three professional organizations, EMEA, PASIG, and NDSA. So a thank you to all of those who participated and might be participating in today's call. So the goal of the survey was to feed research for my thesis titled Climate Change as a Prompt for the Digital Archive, which will be completed in September 2019. In this thesis, I'm interested in exploring the physical presence of digital media and the re relationship institutions have to this new form of collecting. Um, because I'm a moving image archivist in training, the survey sought to assess the presence of video in these digital collections, so that's the first goal. Um, the second goal, I wanted to understand the digital ecosystem implemented by collecting institutions, acknowledging that there's no one-size-fits-all approach. And the third goal uh, was to understand the work culture of these collecting institutions and general attitudes towards digital materiality. To what extent is this acknowledged and discussed by staff, personnel in these places of work? So after a preliminary section that asks participant info, such as job title and institution type, are they working for a for-profit institution, a university, museum, et cetera, I had questions about data storage environments, a sort of breakdown of local and remote storage, are folks using cloud-based storage, are they aware of the geographic dispersion of their files, as well as the types of sustainability initiatives that their institutions might enact. So in this presentation, I, I won't be able to go over everything, but I will be able to go over a few highlights. 
So there were 34 participants. Um, the majority skewed towards academic institutions in North America and more specifically university libraries in the United States. Um, over half of these respondents, over 70%, um, work in digital stewardship as either administrators or a digital archivist or librarian. Um, there were a few minority participants in Europe as well as Australia and Latin America. Um, a significant portion of the participants could not provide exact numbers on percentages on data storage types, citing that this knowledge is primarily tied to the IT department at their respective institutions. Um, another note is that most of these institutions um, that participated do not collect video. Of those that do, all, almost all of these collections easily exceed one petabyte in size, indicating that any storage of video exponentially increases overall data storage demand. And lastly, in terms of sustainability practice, though the overwhelming majority of participants are aware of sustainability practices in their places of work, um, for example, they've adopted some type of green policy. Um, most do not discuss this issue with their colleagues. Furthermore, the issue of environmental sustainability does not yet apply to their digital stewardship practices. So we can begin to see this in some of the testimonials um, that were written in the comments section of the survey. This comment by a digital archivist at an academic institution reflects the challenges brought on by digital video and the ways that Archivist has tried to mitigate these issues. Um, the decision to collect video has had hard consequences on the chosen data storage environment. And as the quote indicates, the increased digitization of AV materials and increased amount of born digital materials has led to an investment of additional storage. Um, in addition to this, DPX film scans, which are cumbersome to manage, alongside the widely considered preservation best practice of storing 10-bit uncompressed video. Uh, those issues have been problem solved by opting for Matroska slash FSB1. Echoing the last testimonial, this moving image curator here suggests these work workarounds imply some level of anxiety by the digital archivist trying to make do with what they have. Um, Perhaps this is a moment here to highlight the importance of an open dialogue, such as the ones posed by Laura's and Keith's team, by Linda, by others, and reconsidering what these best practices should entail when looking at sustainability and its many interpretations, whether it's financial or environmental. So quickly moving on to um, the questions posed relating to sustainability awareness. Um, I'm going to quickly gloss over these since the questions are pretty straightforward. Um, does your institution have a mandate to lessen its environmental impact? As you can see here, the overwhelming majority are aware of some type of green policy at their place of work, which has become popularized, um, a popularized strategy in recent years. Uh, another question is, does your institution recycle e-waste? Um, in the context of an academic institution, I can speak to NYU's experience. It's common to find e-waste receptacles across all floors of the main library. So this, this figure is uh, not exactly surprising since most of the participants are academic libraries. How often is the issue of sustainability discussed? Um, so however, or despite the awareness of these policies, it seems as though this is not translating to a sustained conversation amongst colleagues, staff, and in this context within decision-making for digital stewardship practices. Okay, so next I'm gonna talk a little bit about the questions that centered on disaster preparedness. Um, when faced with an unexpected event or emergency, I wanted to know if digital archivists are perceiving of their digital materials alongside their born analog materials. Um, and I thought a good way to do this was to discuss disaster preparedness plans. So the first question here, does your institution DP plan include a section on data disaster recovery? And most claim that yes, um, over 50%. 
and the second one does the disaster preparedness plan include a strategy to restore or recycle e-waste created by a catastrophic event and most said no over 60 percent um danielle just three yes. minutes more <laughs> okay thank you um the next question are redundant copies kept off site in some cases, though not the majority, as you can see here, participants admitted to not having adequate geographic dispersion. This was called from the comment section um, with all redundant copies stored on campus grounds. So a few key takeaways um, from the survey. Sustainability is tied to IT, and there's a lack of control here by the digital archivist. A recurring theme is a fissure between practitioners and their extra departmental colleagues working in IT. One technical analyst at an academic institution cited the need for cross-departmental collaboration, stating, we are barely able to maintain in-house upkeep and need cooperation with the University Computing Center and a growing awareness of need for copies outside of institutions' premises. Uh, secondly, green campus initiatives do not always translate to digital collections. Um, there needs to be more development, Serena. And lastly, disaster preparedness plans in academic settings do not detail a recovery plans for digital appliances um, or what to do with these physical objects once that they have been damaged by a catastrophic event. So all of these will be problematized further in my thesis, which, as I mentioned, will be completed in September of this year. So. I'll leave it up on this slide, so thank you, everyone. Okay. Thank you, Danielle. Okay, um, Nathan, should I turn it back to you, or do we, do we have time for questions from folks? Uh, we, we have time, so we can open it up to the floor. Um, that was a, a lot of content, um, and I find myself um, a, a bit stymied and kind of wanting to go back through it to, to even ponder questions, because I know I have some. <laughs> well, we will be sent, uh, you know, providing the PDFs of all of our presentations, and I guess they'll be put up to the, the Google Share Drive, Nathan, is that where they'll go? Um, I will link them from the Agenda Notes document. Um, so that's where they will be uh, linked from, um, directly on this, uh, the Agenda Notes document, and I will right now um, just put a uh, drop a link to that in the chat just in case anyone doesn't have it handy do we um there was there was some talk about how the rare earth metals um you know how those often uh end up um, in in countries, you know, where, where they have to sort of um, are, are dealt with, relegated to, for trying to extract other parts of um, the, the components for, for recycling um, or are, are left into landfills. Do we have any quantitative or qualitative uh, data um, or idea about the number of human lives impacted um, directly through those activities. You talked a bit, Linda, about you know the environmental impact and how that stretches. But I mean, um, you know, just this and other areas. You know, there's a lot of just horrible stuff happening. And, and you know, Laura showed that uh, image for the bauxite mine. Um, there's a lot of that kind of thing that happens. Is there any idea of the number of human lives of lives affected without going to to meta um because you really could for the environmental impact aspect mm -hmm. right um okay before i jump in on this laura or keith did you have anything to say about it uh, about that question yeah so just um on the e-waste portion of it uh we cite a couple of um articles and reports, and the numbers are really quite staggering. Um, so the essentially worldwide, it was listed as many thousands. 
um, and that includes tens of thousands of children who are suffering, suffering negative health impacts from um, improper e-waste disposal. And a lot of those impacts are long-term illnesses, especially respiratory illnesses, um, but go all the way to death. Um, so the exact numbers I don't think are known and probably will never be known, but it is many thousands um, is the, the scale we're talking at. Um, and that is from a, essentially a survey of um, health, um, yeah, kind of, kind of public health literature that was published in Lancet Global Health in 2013. One thing that, um, if, if I can jump in here too, there's an off-sited um, location in Ghana, in Accra, it's called, I'm not going to pronounce it correctly, I'm sure, um, Agbogloshi. And that is where the, the, actually the image that I had in my presentation showing the child where there's burning, in, in, you know, basically um, incinerating e-waste put it out in the open air, basically, by just setting it on fire. So there were there are serious problems there and people live around the area. That's this, basically, it's the second largest e-waste processing area in West Africa. So a lot of e-waste was going there. It, it's all burned out in the open air like that. And obviously it was going down into the groundwater. It was going down. People had their chickens in the area. They had, they're growing their vegetables, their food. They live in like a slum area right on the outskirts, right, right around the perimeter of that. And so, um, Obviously, the, the lead levels there were astronomical, and so this was a big health hazard. And so there was a lot of Western press came in there. They did, you know, images. They did video. They documented it. But then what happened was there were like rival groups there in the area, and they took that as an excuse where they had to raise the slum. So they just destroyed the whole area where people were living as an excuse for them to come in and take over the area. So basically when the Western society was thinking we're doing a good deed by making this, by promoting this horrible thing that's happening here and how the, how the e-waste is, is just killing people, it was just used for, as a political tool for others just to take over and kick out these other people who were there. So now, and so people said, okay, gosh, we shouldn't have been doing that. We don't understand. We Westerners, we don't understand the politics of areas. Now, though, there have been reports coming out again where it's worse. It's like where people, again, in their food, there's high levels of lead and toxins and they're eating it. And it's damaging, obviously, their health and it's killing them. So it gets more, it becomes more complicated when you look at it in the global scale of, um, you know, global socio-political, you know, economic basis. Uh, I think we just have to be really careful in how we analyze this data that, that we're receiving. But there was the one from the, the UN, they, they do say there are 200 million people who are at risk for, I'm just looking at my slide again, uh, for a toxic endangerment. So we're not even talking about the air, we're talking about the toxins. So let me see here, I'm going to pull it up. Right, 200 million people are at risk to toxic exposure. The World Health Organization estimates that 23% of the deaths uh, in the developing world are attributable to environmental factors. Thank you. Uh, we have a question uh, in chat from Ewan. Do you have any information on the size of digital preservation's impact in proportion to the rest of the ICT industry? Um, so I'm going to answer this in two parts. The first is sort of, but not really. Um, so we tried to look, we thought about seeing if we could um, estimate it in some way, but it just, the the complexities of um, essentially digital preservation workflows, the systems, the diversity of implementations makes it very difficult to try to get some sort of impact figure, whether that's a carbon equivalent per gigabyte or some other environmental impact figure. So what we ended up doing in the paper is we looked at the Beyond the Repository survey report and NDSA's 2017 Fixity survey report. And we took uh, looked at the, the data behind that and essentially got what we think is a conservative per respondent organization figure for how much they collect. We then took that to OCLC's estimated count for libraries and museums in 2016, 
um, looking at there's approximately 84,000 academic, national, and special libraries, and 79,500 museums globally. So when you take those two together, we looked at this is uh, admittedly not robust, but just kind of gives you an idea of what the un one set unique set of content could be, and it's 5,750 petabytes. Um, so then you can compare that to Cisco Systems estimate of 2016 global data storage, which is 2 million petabytes. So even when you build in redundancy, we're probably looking at somewhere maybe around 1% of global storage is through um, CHOs and preservation. Um, but the the real issue here, and it's something that we've tried to push back against, is that we're not trying to necessarily change the entire ICT industry. We're not trying to push this on to everyone. We're saying this is our area of expertise. This is our area of ownership. So we should step forward and take ownership of this impact, regardless of whether or not um, it can be quantified down to a certain figure and regardless of what its relative scale is to other emitters or other um, major impactors. Um, and that's kind of what we're trying to do here is just saying, this is digital preservation's potential impact that you can see through our use of ICT. So let's see what we can do in the, the realm where we are the owners, then we can take responsibility for this. And what, just one more quick thing to add on this um, is that essentially we realize that this is not ideal, that in ideal preservation world, we would use all the resources we can to have great preservation and keep as much as possible. And in a 100% sustainability world, we wouldn't keep anything because everything we keep is going to have an impact. So we're trying to balance these two and how can we make sure that we fulfill our missions that we push, uh, that we fulfill this need for successful use of content over time, but we don't do so in a way that contributes to a failure of society so that there's nobody left to use our content. So it's really um, a balancing approach between those two, and that's what we're trying to hit at here. And I would love for someone to be inspired to do further research and try to find out exactly what the impact of digital preservation activities are. So feel free to jump in, everybody. <laughs> well, I'm looking really forward to reading the full article. And, you know, first step might be trying to figure out what is it that we have to measure and, and start to, to capture within our institutions. And, you know, is there a way we can try to uh, make that something that we're doing? regularly so that these can be more easily quantified because they're probably not even always easy to quantify these things. Any other questions? Oh, and a thanks from you and in the chat in case you didn't see that. Well, we are right up um, to the hour, um, we have our next meeting in June, which is a software toolkit show and tell. Um, I believe we're going to get a preview of Dart um, uh, from AP Trust, which is um, kind of like exactly um, in a way that can bag content according to standard profiles and send it. Um, it's a little more uh, plug and play extensible. Um, possibly also, uh, if it can be arranged, maybe from um, Project Electron and Aurora from Rockefeller Center Archives. Um, I know Paul Clough from University of Miami is arranging that. Um, I want to thank you to uh, Linda uh, Tadic and all of our presenters uh, today. Um, really, really interesting presentations today. Um, look forward to digging into the PDFs and uh, the full articles, uh, article from um, uh, the American Archivist um, and perhaps even uh, the thesis uh, 
So thank you so much. Um, any any last last questions anyone wants to squeeze in? All right, thank you all, and I hope everyone enjoys the rest of their Monday. Take care. Thanks, Nathan. Thank, thank you so much. Thank Have you, everybody. Bye.